let me say that I'm honored and indeed um, privileged to be asked to um, say a few words here in, on the uh, Robert Schumann lecture. And let me, at the outset, congratulate you and the Lisbon Council on your 10th anniversary. And I pay tribute to the board, its leadership, particularly you, Anne, and to Paul for your invaluable work over the years. The uh, foundation came shortly before Ireland's last presidency in 2004, before which the Lisbon Council and Ireland's representatives here in Brussels made their very first contacts. And since then, that partnership has been very strong across Europe and here in Brussels. We continue to be inspired and indeed guided by Schumann's work and by his philosophies as a founding father of this union. He did say, Europe will not be made all at once or according to a single plan. It will be built through concrete achievements which first create a de facto solidarity. His work and his words are not just an important part of our history, of our identity. They are fundamental to what it is that we are as Europeans. And today they remind us that our union uh, is a work in progress. When Schumann spoke of what he called the modernization of production and the improvement of its quality, he was, of course, at that time referring to coal and steel. But equally, he could have been speaking of the many goods and services that are sourced and traded across the European Union. His vision for Europe his vision of Europe was a vision where living standards were raised, where through modernization and cooperation, that peace would be achieved, that solidarity would be achieved, that we could generate exports within our union and to other parts of the world. So the words that Robert Schumann spoke in 1950 are still very appropriate today. And 60 years on, we see that they reflect the principles and the ideas that will guide this union from its recent crisis to recovery, to stability, to growth, and to jobs. And such outcome is the essence of the current Irish presidency. 2013 is a year of landmarks, a year of anniversaries. It is the Lisbon Council's 10th. It is Ireland's 40 years as a member of the European Union. We mark our seventh presidency, all of which occurs in this, the important year of the citizen for Europe. Our membership of the European Union has essentially been a story of transformation. Today, there are six times the number of people in higher education than there were in 1973. Three times as many women work outside the home. We joined the then European Economic Community, trading mainly with our nearest neighbor, and still our nearest neighbor, the UK. <laughs> Thank you. Today. <laughs> Today, we export over 54 billion worth, uh, euro worth of goods right across the EU. That's over half of our total exports. And that transformation has been more than economic and social. Schumann's ideals of peace and mutual respect saw the EU play an important and fundamental role in the peace process on the island of Ireland. We can talk with some <coughs> experience of what that means, of having 30 years of troubles and terrorism and, and death and the impact it leaves on families and the social structure and reputation and, and perception and how important it is to have a collegiality and an understanding that there is support um, and confidence out there from a European perspective, from uh, an American perspective, and from the close relationships that we have built up over the years 
with Brit different British governments. The Council, as I understand it, Anne, has always been concerned not alone with I ideals and solutions, but actual delivery of these. This is the essence of politics. For me, it's always about people. And it's not just good enough to tick the boxes and say we've achieved this without it being translated into impact and effect and understanding for our citizens. Never more important than at a time when 26 million people are unemployed in the European Union. This is completely unacceptable and sets out the challenge for political leadership that requires truth and trust and courage and imagination to deal with it. And by delivery, I mean our union and its members doing what has been promised and implementing what has been agreed. Because it's not good enough that citizens see decisions made by the council that are not followed through, that for whatever reason, obstacles suddenly spring up to thwart the intention of political leadership in implementing them. And one of the many challenges facing this union over the years, and I've seen it myself since joining the European Council, is that of confidence, market confidence, consumer confidence, business confidence. And it means that you have to have an understanding of trust between governments and between leaders before confidence can begin to flow. And of course, and fundamentally, citizen confidence. Citizens don't have confidence in the democratic process. It leads to frustration and anger and streets and violence and creation of, creation of uh, incidents right and left that are not in anybody's interests. And one of the ways to win and sustain that confidence is the demonstrated will of leaders to carry through decisions that are taken. And the emphasis on delivery is absolutely consistent with the Irish presidency's message and its policy program for three fundamental principles of stability, of growth, and of jobs. So whether the citizen be in Portugal, or in Greece, or in Sweden, or in Ireland, or in Brussels, they have to see and understand that politics works, that when decisions are made, that they're carried through, and they're carried through in the interests of the peoples of the union where we all live. So we're committed to uh, working on a recovery for Europe, uh, one that lasts and one that lives, much like the commitment that we have to dealing with the problems that we face in Ireland. Government I lead was elected just um, two years ago, this week. And in the three years prior to that election, we lost 250,000 jobs in the private sector. The entire construction industry collapsed. And because the tools and mechanisms that are available now were not available then, Ireland was the first country that was forced into a bailout and required to borrow 64 billion, which has been an enormous burden in terms of our borrowing requirements and on the capacity of our people to deal with it. And but for their patience and their pragmatism and their understanding that when decisions are made, they're made in the nation's interest, but they're carried through, we like to see that the problem is sorted out not sorted out just for now, but sorted out for the generations to come. This cannot be allowed to happen again. So I know I'm speaking to people here who are intimately acquainted with the workings of the union um, and know far more about many of the, of the, um, of the minute issues uh, than I do. But you also know that the, the potential and the limits of what a presidency can achieve in its six months. And you're also aware that the presidency 
does not hold all the cards. It is a more complex, a more subtle leadership role that involves connections, that involves partnerships with other countries, with the Commission, the President of the Council, the Parliament, other institutions, other organisations that have uh, a responsibility. So no presidency can do everything, but each and every presidency has a duty and a responsibility to do what it can. It should make sure that it does specific things, first and always with the, with the current concerns of the people at its mind, uh, in its mind and at its heart. Uh, and in preparing for this presidency, which is our seventh, I have to say that the government and everybody associated with it, all of the public servants, prepared very well for the presidency because we recognize that it's not only in Ireland's interest, it is in Europe's interest to run an effective presidency, that the signal goes out worldwide around the globe that Europe is coming back, that Europe can and will come back. And the evidence is there before us, even this week, whether it be youth guarantees or CRD4s or whatever. These are major movements and will be carried through and seen to be in the Union's interest and in its relations, both internally and with the Greater Union. Um, and because we understand this, and I should say to you that Ireland's peculiar in the sense that as an island nation, we've had um, a tendency to travel or be required to travel for centuries. In fact, as far back as the sixth century, educators and missionaries came here to, to, uh, to Europe and set up monasteries all over the many countries. But also, because of uh, history, uh, involvement with the United States and Australia and Britain and many countries in Europe, we have this understanding of what it is to connect to other people, that you need to know the systems that work in other places. And that's why this presidency um, has, has, a, has a DNA, if I might use an equine phrase these days, has a DNA <laughs> in understanding what makes the system tick. And that's why it's very important to understand that our people do engage uh, with others uh, with an objective in mind here of sorting these things out. So a good presidency actually is about creating and keeping that momentum uh, around core issues that you move on and have a sense of signposts being achieved. And that means engaging directly at the highest political level uh, and investing time and energy at official level, which is done from working groups upwards. And at the end of the day, politics at the, at the top or bottom of the pyramid, whichever way you want to look at it, has got to make choices and make decisions. Um, and I can't commend enough all of the many unseen and unknown officials who do Trojan work in preparing for these, the groundwork for these. So we've uh, worked hard at preparing relationships and at working at those relationships. Um, uh, I, think the, I think the evidence, uh, Anne, if I may say so, is that people look at, at, at my country now very differently than they did just two years ago, where you had neither credibility nor integrity and nor name and the place was in tatters. They now know we're serious, serious about sorting out our own problem and because we are interdependent in a, in a European and a global sense, it's uh, also in Europe's interest that we move on uh, and deal with these things. Well, that's why at the multi-annual financial framework, uh, we want to secure agreement with the Parliament uh, on this and it's now our mandate following the decision of the Council to actually achieve that. It's not easy given the difference of opinions and policy that there can be within the parliament, given all those numbers, given the fact that the elections are next year, given the fact that some people want to play games already and say, I'm making a stance now uh, because of this. Okay, uh, we understand all of that political, all of the political uh, picture up ahead. But at the end of the day, people have got to understand that the parliament has every right to have its say, every right to give its consent, every right to give its approval because that's what people voted for in the Lisbon Treaty. And we understand that, and we respect the European Parliament and the mandate given to it. But we also understand that politicians representing parties and countries know that you have to have a budget, 
that is credible, that is fit for purpose, and that can be spent in the interests of um, in the interests of the peoples that they represent. Now, just last week, I had a meeting with uh, President Schultz in uh, in Dublin, and uh, President Barroso, from whom you've heard, and we had uh, very good sessions with them on, the, on this. Now, we want to see the uh, MFF agreed and in good time. We want to see the deals finalised and concluded as soon as possible on legislation that will see effectively almost a trillion euro of investment for uh, jobs and growth for the, for, the, for the seven years from 2014 on. So we're also applying a lot of momentum to the work on economic governance, uh, financial services, banking union. As you know, the agreement has been brokered on the so-called two-pack. We've achieved uh, a cru crucial breakthrough on Capital Requirements Directive, or CRD4. Um, we intend to make substantial progress on banking union, starting with the adoption of the single supervisory mechanism. And I might say, you know, to cynics who would say, well, you're never going to have a European bailout mechanism, you'll never have an EFSF, you'll never have an ESS, uh, EFSM, you'll never have an ESM, you're going to have people leaving the euro, going to be people forced out of the European Union, you'll never break the link between sovereign and bank debt, you'll never put in place the architecture for a single supervisory mechanism. All these things have happened and a lot more to follow and a lot more to come. So I hope that the, that the Ministers of Finance will be able to deal with the structures and the mechanics of single supervisory mechanism by June, as, as, as was originally agreed, and we move then through to, uh, to banking union. So that's all about uh, stability, about message, about, about confidence, about sending out the word around the world that this European Union is not going anywhere, only forwards and upwards, challenging though the times are. Uh, Commissioner Gehagen Quinn was here last year and, and gave this lecture. Uh, we, need, um, we need a European Union with uh, solid foundations that's better able to cope with shocks and challenges. And those mechanisms are now being put in. One of the, um, one with the necessary structural reforms that have been debated here at the Lisbon Council. And in, the same, in the same process, the same spirit, we're working to ensure that the third European semester, um, which is the most meaningful and the most effective yet, uh, will be carried out with maximum democratic legitimacy. Always a point of co concern and, and, and debate. Now, EU-level discussions on fiscal policy, on macroeconomic imbalances, on financial sector issues, on growth-enhancing structural reforms are taking place jointly during our presidency, and they will feed into the national budgetary processes in the second stage. Um, in terms of growth and jobs, when you consider that 95% of the world's trade is taking place and will be taking place outside the borders of the European Union, then surely we have to understand that we have to be out there, we have to be connected, we have to have capacity, we have to an under, uh, understanding that uh, with the greatest cluster of developed economies on the planet here in Europe, there are endless opportunities for us. Uh, and trade is an issue that is at the core of this presidency because we recognize that a, a series of strategic trade partnerships for the Union could certainly add together over 2% of GDP to the EU's GDP or 275 billion euro. This is more than the GDP of many member states, including my own. It's estimated that if you follow that through, these partnerships could lead to the creation of in excess of two million new jobs across the European Union. It would bring relief and hope and confidence, and not also, uh, not also uh, a, a little joy to, uh, to many of the 26 million men and women um, who live and walk the streets who are currently unemployed, just to be the central feature of the effect and impact of good politics. So in terms of a key relationships, there's a mix here. Uh, the United States is a case in point. The agreement last month to pursue negotiations on transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnership is extremely significant. The Irish presidency will ensure momentum on this as we seek to um, secure agreement on a negotiating mandate during the course of our presidency, that the talks could start after that. Um, as you know, Ireland has a particularly um, particularly unique relationship with the United States in many ways, because from the first immigrants who went over there through trades unions and business and commerce and culture and literature and art and music and politics, 
all the way up to the White House. We've been represented on many occasions. It gives us an opportunity and that, um, that the United States trusts Ireland in the sense of what it's doing here for Europe is, uh, is seeking to have the mandate put in place that the discussions can then start. And they won't be that easy because different countries have different views, uh, but the potential is enormous. Um, so, so growth and jobs will flow from the work that we do, and they must continue to do, we must continue to do that, particularly in terms of delivering on the single market objectives, which of course uh, have always been close to the heart of the Lisbon Council here. So in that context, you know, a good presidency should look equally at all the legislation on the negotiating table as a bundle of shared objectives, not as individual proposals to be seen or to be discussed purely in isolation. So we've been taking this approach using those three pillars of stability, jobs and growth. And with these headings, we have sector specific bundles, if you like, that we are prioritizing. One of these is a, a group of legislative measures aimed at promoting SMEs, including the COSME and the Horizon 2020 MFF programs for fast growing and imaginative SMEs. This is the future of so many economies. This is the future for millions of lives where SMEs are allowed to thrive and prosper and do their business and get people employed. And we're also working on SME friendly public procurement and accounting legislation, intellectual property and a range of others. Second bundle is in the single, um, is the objective of a digital single market, which we will believe will be the the key driver of growth and jobs. And on this, I will uh, follow closely the Lisbon Council's project on innovation economics, which I understand is being launched at the summit here. We also have a bundle aimed at um, youth unemployment, from education to, uh, right through to qualifications mobility, through the Erasmus for All program, to the youth guarantee, which was secured last week. I mean, when you go through some of the, some of the countries in Europe, with unemployment among young people under 25 at less than 3% in a number of countries and over 50% in others. You can see the range and challenge that's here. And it is not good for society, for any society, to have huge numbers of young people, educated, intelligent, confident, energetic, willing to contribute, to be given a sort of sense of no hope, uh, no future, no prospects, that's where politics has got to change this. And that's why I was really happy that six billion was put into the MFF program for youth unemployment for countries over 25%. And that's why we need to get the MFF agreed as quickly as possible, that plans and effective uh, uh, programs can be put in place for that to, um, for that to happen. So if this is a, a key test of European leadership the courage of leaders, the vision, the imagination of what Schumann said to make the place a better world for everybody and have peace as a, as a solid thread through all of that. We can avoid, you know, the, um, the potential catastrophe of losing another generation of young people. We have the tools and the facility and the capacity to do all of this if Europe is prepared to grasp the future in that sense. So, a good presidency and should bring lessons from, from our own national story to bear. And uh, our story is much the same as Europe's in so many ways. I spoke of the transformation of our country 40 years on. We've undergone radical reform and change in the last number of years. Our crisis led to a serious crash. Budget surpluses turned into double digit deficits. Unemployment rose from 4% to over 14%. The banking system collapsed entirely. It had to be rescued, as I said, at 64 billion cost to the taxpayer and with dramatic consequences, therefore, for our national debt and indeed our national mood. And all of this happened before the mechanisms and tools that are now available were put in place. So our people responded to this with extraordinary resilience and understanding. And the lesson for the politician is that you cannot ever beat the truth, because people know. And when you tell them what the truth is, they understand that decisions have to be made that are sometimes very difficult, because nobody's going to walk in and sort it out for you. It's people and governments and union working together. So in that sense, um, we've, we've made quite a number of successes and um, progress, but we still have a long way to go. 
We ended the bank guarantee, which was in place since 2008, just last week. We sold also a key financial institution. There are signs of confidence coming back into our economy. Uh, there had been a growth in private sector jobs for the first time uh, of over 18,000 in the last 15 months. Um, but I think the, the, number of uh, the number of employed people is now rising, and there's a sense of confidence coming back. We recognize the obstacles that are up ahead. And that's why I say, as Ireland, but also as part of Europe, it's important that the decisions made at European level be followed through, and they are being followed through. Uh, we produced an action plan for jobs with 270 propositions for small and medium enterprises. This year's program has over 300 in it. We intend to open the doors for business, listen to business, and not have it bureaucratic or administrative or too costly, and the decisions being made at European level uh, will also bear fruit in that sense. So we need an economy that's good for people, and I see the same situation here in Europe. So we've got um, the, the, the other issue that we're working on, of course, is the breach between sovereign and bank debt, which was made on the 29th of June last year in Brussels here, uh, and that gives us the opportunity to focus on a single market that's... Uh, that has enormous potential for the, for the 21st century. So leaders have done the talking, if you like, but our people now have got to see the results. They want to see action, and the people can be very impatient, uh, but they, they have to see the evidence and the confidence that Europe is actually able to deliver. So I look for stability and credibility and those jobs and growth, and so do the people of Europe. So I said, I said to President Van Rompuy, there's a premium attached to the presidency in that you work closely with the president of the council and therefore with all of the other, all of the other leaders around that table. And the mandate now given to us to work with the European Parliament uh, will, be, uh, will be carried through. So I'd like to see a big reaction in a positive way to the efforts being made by this presidency to demonstrate its effectiveness at the June Council when we can report what it is that has been achieved in these, uh, in these, uh, in these six months. So uh, I don't believe that treaty change is an issue for the shorter term. We've got a lot of work to do to get our house in order, uh, and that's what we intend to, f to focus on. Um, as I said, over 90% of trade will be outside the borders of the Union. It gives us an enormous opportunity if we want to grasp it. Um, as I said, this union is about people, our people, their ambitions, their families, their desires, about their needs, and policies has got to respond to that. So at the end of it all, as I said, the redemptive dignity of being able to provide a job for somebody is what can make, make their careers, make their lives worthwhile in the different societies that we have here. So that dignity and that value of work goes back to Robert Schumann's fundamental philosophies about the why of Europe. And that's why I'm here to say these few words to you. His declaration of 63 years ago is as valid today as it was then. We all have a responsibility to build on those principles and those philosophies in the interest of the 500 million people that we represent. Thank you very much.